Hi there. If you've never clicked on a video from this channel, my name is Seth, and I fucking love computers. Despite my efforts to not be a hoarder, I have a bit of a collection, each from a slightly different time period, each with a different purpose, and each named after a Sonic the Hedgehog character. Yes, I am autistic. How did you know? But when you've built a decade-long love for computers like I have, you learn to appreciate all the interesting little bits about each one. You know, what made them special or unique. Did you know about the Pentium 4's netburst architecture? It leaned heavily into long instruction pipelines, which Intel thought was a good strategy going into the internet age, but turned out to be so awful they went back to the Pentium 3's design for preceding chips. Did you know that the Core 2 Quad is basically two Core 2 duos glued together? See? Two dies on one chip. That was actually pretty common during the early multicore era. The PS3 isn't really a desktop computer per se, but did you know about the PS3's cell architecture? It was super ahead of its time, designed with multiple parallel processing units like a supercomputer, but was really hard to program for. The PlayStation 3 makes my life as a software developer much harder. However, if you could harness its power, it's said that the cell could rival the CPU power of even the PS4. Learning facts like this is super neat, of course, but it also helps put me in the mindset of an enthusiast back then and appreciate how fast and impressive this tech really was. So now that I understand that mindset, what's stopping any of that from being true now? Do you actually know what a megahertz is? It's one million cycles. If you have a CPU that runs at just one megahertz, it's performing its computation cycle literally a million times per second. This is Rotor, the slowest desktop computer that I own. It has a Pentium 3 running at 1.4 GHz. That's 1.4 billion cycles per second. Without any other comparison or context, that is blazingly fast. In fact, it's the fastest Pentium 3 that they ever made. So why is it not fast anymore? It's just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? Okay, yes, I know this is the redundant pleading of an enthusiast. Why is my weird 25-year-old nostalgia box that only I care about not still cutting edge? I know why it's not fast anymore. It's because we've come to expect more things from our computers. We need them to do more complex things. But do we really, though? At what point is enough power enough power? My point is... If it weren't for the web and video games, lots of people would still be happy with Core 2 Duos, Pentium 4s, or even older machines. I agree with Cathode Ray Dude, and I want to prove that we're right. I've always been curious if I could use my retro tech hobby knowledge to get away with using an extremely old computer as a daily driver, and I need to go back and play old classic games anyway. So let's do it. I'm going to use Rotor as my only home desktop computer for two weeks. Let's see how it goes. Hi, welcome back. I'm Seth. So the rules I made for this challenge are pretty simple. First, Rotor is the only desktop PC that I can use at home for the duration of the challenge. Two, I like have a job and I'm not willing to go homeless for a stupid YouTube challenge. So using my work laptop at home is allowed, but only for work. Three, connecting to services hosted on the internet or on my home server is allowed. I wanna see exactly how far this old computer can go with as much help as possible, short of just using it as a terminal to control a different machine. Also, just for the record, I don't recommend connecting old OS's to the internet for extended periods of time, at least not without a good firewall, so don't try this at home, kids. Four, cell phone and modern TV use is allowed, for now. I'll be monitoring and potentially limiting that if I find that I'm avoiding my computer in order to use my phone, but the point of this challenge isn't to go off the grid or put any of my friendships on hold, so I'm still gonna have my phone. I'm not pulling an Eddie Burback here. God knows I can't grow a mustache like that one. So now we get to the fun part, <laughs> preparation. Let's get this out of the way. Rotor dual boots Windows 2098, and I'm keeping it that way. Part of this challenge is showing that old software is still useful too, not just old hardware. And honestly, I think the compatibility we would get by using a newer OS wouldn't matter that much because it would perform like crap. Who cares if we can get modern software to run if it's unusably slow? I am still genuinely curious if XP or Puppy Linux or something would work better for this, so let me know in the comments if you want to see a follow-up video using a different OS. With that said, what do I actually do with my desktop computer? What does Rotor need to do? Let's go down the list. First, I watch a whole lot of YouTube. Two, I check my email. Three, I chat on Discord. Four, I browse the internet. <clears throat> Mostly <clears throat> Reddit. Oh God, oh God, oh fuck. And Facebook Marketplace, I guess. Five, I play games. And six, I make videos. So for YouTube, this one was really fun to figure out, but ultimately disappointing. On the newest web browser I could get running, some custom build of Pale Moon, YouTube will actually load, kind of, but it's absurdly slow, not an option. There are various lighter weight front-end proxies for YouTube out there, though most require downloading a client program, which is not compatible with Windows 2000. What got me closest to being able to watch videos was Invidious. 
I had actually already set up an NVIDIA's host on my home server for a previous video, so just updating that got me able to browse and load up videos just fine. But it was still barely too slow. Videos don't quite play at full speed consistently, which is frustrating because I know this computer can load and play standard def video just fine. It'll play DVDs and Streamplex via XBMC at 480p. NVIDIA's must just have a little too much overhead for this machine. And no, I can't just copy video URLs into VLC to stream like you used to be able to. YouTube's adblock fuckery has made that impossible. So I just decided that I'd watch YouTube on my TV during this challenge. Rotor might be able to watch YouTube in the future. If NVIDIA's becomes lighter weight or projects like this one get public releases, please. But yeah, at least using a TV feels era appropriate, I guess. It's how you would have consumed video content during the turn of the millennium anyway. Thankfully, every other part of this list had a happy ending. For email, I just need an email client with semi-modern security standards. I settled on an old version of Becky, an uh, email client that's apparently popular in Japan. For Discord, I just downloaded Discord Messenger after watching this video from Matt KC, which worked perfectly and gave me access to pretty much every Discord feature I could want, minus audio calling. I already showed you the best web browser that I could find, which loads a surprising amount of websites straight up, but it's still really slow for more modern sites. For those, I turned to Browse Service, which you might have seen in a video by Michael MJD. This project essentially runs a modern web browser on a different machine, in this case on a Ubuntu VM in my home server, and streams its session via images to whatever older browser connects to it. Given I'm using it for specific websites, websites I think would load fine on Rotor if the modern web weren't so unnecessarily bloated and slow, I don't feel using browse service goes against the no remote desktop rule. If you feel differently, let me know in the comments. For games, I'm just going to play old games that I had already loaded up on this computer. Here's the list I went in wanting to play. Finally, making videos. Obviously, I can't edit 4K video on Rotor, so I'm just not going to. I can, however, write the script. So with a copy of Microsoft Office 2000 loaded up on here, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Word art, clippy, and all. After getting home from work, it felt pretty weird to boot up Rotor rather than Sonic. Whew. Oh, wait. Right but I didn't immediately feel disconnected from the world like I thought I would. I checked my email and sent messages on Discord like normal. I even ordered some cheap SSDs on Amazon via browse service, maybe for the last time in a long while. Finally, I booted up ZDoom LE and beat the first episode of Doom for the first time. It was a blast. I like, get it. It's super easy to see why Doom was so influential for FPS games and why it's still a classic. It's still really fun 30 years later. On day two, those SSDs came in and I installed them in some laptops I was refurbishing. Thankfully, I already had a flash drive with the Windows 11 installer, but I was also able to load up teardowns for the laptops on New Moon natively with no issues. Even the Dell website loaded okay eventually. I did feel a little silly installing Windows 11 on those laptops while being forced to use Windows 2000, but that's okay. We do it for the vine. On day three, I tried browsing Reddit for the first time. It was okay, not ideal, but with my desktop resolution turned up a little bit and browse surfaces quality turned down, it's definitely doable. Videos don't play for some reason, but that's not a huge issue. I also played an episode of Quake and had a ton of fun, similar to Doom. Am I a boomer shooter guy? I might be a boomer shooter guy. On day four, I watched the animated How to Train Your Dragon for the first time from my Plex server via XBMC. It looked great. Not HD, but a little better than a DVD. This monitor isn't ideal for widescreen content by any means, but it's hard to beat the colors and the motion clarity of a good CRT. Immediately following day four, I got extremely sick. Don't worry about it. I'm fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I'm good. After laying in bed for three days, I came back to Rotor to work on the script. Hey, Clippy. How does Microsoft Office 2000 still feel like overkill for everything? Look how many options are here. I can't for the life of me figure out what they actually add to all these updates in Microsoft Office now. I'm sure glad not to see the Copilot button. At least Clippy stays in one spot and doesn't add itself to every possible context menu. The next day I decided to give multiplayer Classic Cube a shot. And just, wow. If you have not joined a server on Classic Cube using a retro computer, Please, I am begging you, give it a shot. It's kind of the coolest fucking thing ever. For some reason, I had only ever used Classic Cube as basically a tech demo, just installing it on whatever and dinking around in single player going, wow, look how good Minecraft Classic could run on this garbage. But multiplayer is a whole different ball game. This is just straight up Minecraft. Look at all this cool shit people built that I could explore. Look how well it's running on this 25 year old computer. Like what?
That continued to blow my mind for the next couple days, but eventually I also tried out Warcraft 3. Also really, really good. I know Dota started as a mod of this game, but now I can very clearly see how much Dota 2 and early League took design cues from this game. I have no idea how I did get addicted to an RTS game like this earlier in my life. The progression mechanics here scratches some itch really deep in my brain. On day 11, I actually made this update post to my YouTube channel, fully using Rotor. I guess I did take a picture on my phone, but all I had to do was email it to myself, and with Rotor and browse service, I could do everything else. The final couple days were uneventful. I wrote more of the script, I chatted on Discord, browsed a little bit of Facebook Marketplace, and I guess I watched some Twin Peaks on XBMC. 4x3 content looks really good on this CRT. Eventually, day 14 came and went. The next day, I booted up Sonic like nothing had happened. Even as someone who's had a desktop PC battle station since he was 12, it didn't feel like a huge life change to switch over, and it didn't feel like a huge life change to switch back. It may not have ended with a bang, but this challenge did end with a lot of bang for your buck. <sighs> so to conclude, I think this challenge was a huge success. I came out of these couple weeks feeling totally normal, minus the sickness, and with an appreciation for a lot of hardware history, software history, and especially the work that people in the retro tech community put into their projects. Seriously, this would not have all been possible without the work of hundreds of unpaid people putting serious time into projects like Browse Service, Nvidia's, and Classic Cube. But what this challenge really put into perspective for me was the sheer amount of tech waste that exists in this world. Think about it, if a machine this old is still as capable as I've proved it to be, imagine how useful a Pentium 4 machine can be, or a Core 2 Quad. Now imagine how many machines that are more powerful than that are rotting away in e-waste recycling centers or even landfills thanks to planned obsolescence and Microsoft's arbitrary Windows 11 requirements. Millions of machines that are leagues more powerful than Rotor are currently trash, I guess, because this hamster wheel of consumption we're on needs our money. We're tossing aside these machines that are technological marvels just because I don't know, Reddit needs to look more modern, Windows needs more overhead so it can steal all your data in the background and serve you ads. If I can stay on this high horse for just a little longer. I think in a better world, one that really cared about efficiency, we'd have software today that would run just fine on old ass hardware. Maybe not this old, but like, I don't know, man. Sometimes I think all the computing power that we have today just gives big tech companies the overhead to abuse us. The whole point of tech is to make our lives better, remember? It's supposed to make things better, give us more control over our lives, better tools to navigate reality. If all of this raw computing power that we have at our fingertips isn't actually making things better, then what's the point? Anyway, I'm getting really off topic. I will save the rest of that for a video essay or something. Thanks for watching. If you like this video pushing old tech to its absolute limits, consider liking or subscribing or hyping. I'm still not sure how people actually do that, but it seems to be very helpful. If you got this far in the video, I have more videos in the works that you will definitely like. Anyway, that's all for now. Have a good one.